What day? Let me know. Yeah. Tamia, thank you so much for joining us and joining me for this great conversation. I'm so happy to have a chance to spend some time with you. I've heard so much about you and the impact you've had here at Paraffin, so I'm really excited to talk about it. So thank you so much for joining. This is Tamia Nagy, and she is here as a, as a partner and as a consultant to Paraffin with a very specific focus. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about your personal story, and then we can talk about what brought you to Paraffin. Thank you so much. I feel very welcomed and I'm also extremely excited to sit here with you and have this conversation. I also read a lot about you and heard a lot about you and I really appreciate all the passion and everything that you bring into that world where you <laughs> exist. So thank you so much for having me. Um, so as you said, my name is Tamia and um, about 24 years ago, I actually lived in Budapest, Hungary. And uh, from the age of 16 to 21, I had a production company. Um, and we did really well. It was a great, great time. But by the age of 21, my family got into a financial crisis. Um, and um, we were faced with potentially losing our home. There's a lot more to the story, obviously. People don't, just don't wake up one day and have all kinds of trauma to get to a place where they make silly decisions. I also grew up in a pretty uh, harsh childhood home and environment. Uh, but beside that, by the time I was 21, we had a, fi a financial crisis where we were about to lose our home. And that my mom was in and out of the hospitals and my brother were just coming back from the army. And so I figured that maybe I'll figure it out how we save our home. So I didn't speak English, um, uh, but it was very exciting when an opportunity came to come to Canada to work for three months as a young girl, English not necessarily, that was the ad, and do general work and make about $1,500 a month. Mm. So I added up three months, it's exactly what we need to save our home. So um, I came, I signed a contract in Hungary in English, but they told me what's in it. Uh, they took all of my personal information, where I live, my mom, the name of my cat, believe it or not, just in case of an emergencies. And off I went to Canada, to this world that I've never been to before. Wow. First time on the airplane, don't speak English, no nothing. I'm 21. I mean, I had a business and I was tough, but it's different. It's like very different, a uh, huge culture shock. So I landed in Canada and I went to the immigration as I was told. I didn't even know what immigration was. <laughs> Gone through a huge culture shock, even at the airport. And they asked me a bunch of questions. The long story short turns out that my agency, my temp agency, was actually an international human trafficking ring. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I, there was no way I'm gonna do general work. I was literally taken the same night to a strip joint. Wow. And I was transformed That same night, the, the same day you arrived? In six hours. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. I was transformed into a sex worker, sex, um, a stripper and sex slave, basically, and I vanished in in a, in a dark side of Toronto, Canada, for three months. Did they take your passport? Like, how did they make it so that they brought you in, they lured you in, and then suddenly you were put in a situation where you couldn't you couldn't get out? That's um, a really good question. So the minute we landed and I was taken to a motel, there was two Hungarian guys and a Canadian guy. And the two Hungarian guys basically told me that now I owe them a lot of money for the flight, for the contract, for everything that they've done for oh, me. Oh, wow. I owe them $3,500 and they need the money right now because they work for Sasha, a Ukrainian boss, and Sasha doesn't mess around. And if I don't pay them, they're going to go and hurt my family. And I said to them, at the time I was oh still a little smart ass because right. I didn't know what's going on. I was like, hey, dude, if I had that money, I wouldn't be here. That's right. what I need That's like all, almost all the money they were going to pay you. Yeah. So they're like, oh, being a smart ass. Okay, let's uh, let's show you where you're going to be for the next three months. And uh, so they took me, took me to a strip joint and they like, this is where you're going to work. This is how much you have to make every single day until you pay off your debt. And... You know, at the first two weeks, they were actually nice. 
They're like, mm-hmm. no, you good at this. You great. You'll just see. You make all this money. You and your family is going to be so well. And they were just nice. Like, what do you need? What can we do to help you? It's kind of like being a part of a family. And really, at the beginning, we kind of all believe that. And the fact that you're working in a strip joint, they kind of make it sound like it's cool. It's, or it's normal. And yeah. it's totally yeah. normal. I've never seen this before. I don't know what it's like to be a sex worker. So I'm like... Well, he said, I'm not a prostitute and this is not sex work. So this is not sex work. It's kind of cool. And so that was the mindset Mm. for a while until reality kind of set in. Wow. And what happened when reality set in? Like, how did you come to the realization that this was not not the life that you were supposed to be living when you got here? What, how did you kind of, how did you escape, I guess? Yeah, I thought about that a lot since then, but I think the moment when I realized something was really wrong here when, so by this time I worked 20 hours a day, so we weren't allowed to leave. Oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, the club or the motel, it was just motel club, club motel, motel club, club motel. I was in Canada for like, I don't know how long, probably a month. I still haven't left the hotel. Eventually, they told us, if you leave the hotel, you're going to be considered that you're escaping. And then we're going to have to punish you. And then we're going to have, there's many ways for punishment, physical or emotional or Mm -hmm. psychological Mm -hmm. torture. They were very much into psychological. Only a couple of times they used forces. But that was enough for you to think like, okay, I'm not going to leave the motel. And so the invisible chain is what they were creating for the first two mm-hmm. weeks. I always say this, if you don't sleep, if you are told what to do constantly and told what happens to you if you leave that door and threatened all the time and you're not getting food because we weren't fed either, then you break down and eventually you just become this zombie and right. do whatever they ask you Absolutely. to do. Absolutely. So that's, I became a zombie and I was on autopilot and it just happened like so quickly But I remember sitting in my motel one afternoon, uh, just getting, just waiting to be picked up for the next shift. I'm sitting in my window and I look out and there's a sign that Niagara Falls that way. I was only like 100 kilometers away from Niagara, maybe an hour drive. I've never seen it. I've been here for I don't know how long. But I, and there was a gas station and I saw a car stopping, kids getting out, going, getting ice cream. And I said, when was the last time I was allowed to do that? And how come I can't even go to the gas station to get ice cream? This is really wrong. Something is really wrong here. And I give my money away every single day. So I counted how much money I made by this time. Altogether in three months, I made $40,000. Oh my gosh. In 1998. Tell me about it. And you had to hand it away every single night. So you never got to, you, yeah. you had to do the mental math to figure out how much you'd made for for these human traffickers. Yeah. And every time I give them money, they're like, you still owe us. And I'm like, how? Well, because you changed the light bulb in the car and that's your fault. So it costs $560 to change a light bulb in a car. Didn't right. you know that? Yeah. I found out 10 years later that I was a lie. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so it kind of took a little while. Okay, so you ultimately just left. Did you just leave the hotel and kind of, what did you do? Like when oh, you left? What? Oh, no, no. I was gonna, uh, yeah. yeah, no, so you're not allowed to do that. But eventually with the help of a uh, dictionary and an individual who worked in the club who spoke Hungarian, he, he wasn't uh-huh. Hungarian, but his parents were. So we started talking and he's like, um, I think you are in trouble. I'm like, no, I'm not in trouble because we weren't allowed to talk to anybody because then they're going to kill our family in Hungary. Wow. So even if I tell you right now, I really need your help, what's going to happen? My family is going to get killed in my mind. Right, right? of course. And there's plenty of evidence around us that they did to show us that they have no problem doing that. So you will, you do believe that this of is course. a real... Of course, absolutely. Uh, well, well they taken, they taken all of your personal information when yeah. you signed up. And so they did, in fact, know. I mean, you you knew that they knew everything about you and your family. So I could see how that would be completely credible. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing is we weren't, like, we were allowed to call home, but they would be standing next to me. So I wouldn't call home. So for three months, my family thought I died, like I was gone. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That was pretty rough. So, but um, the way I escaped is I, in the club, I started communicating 
with the staff when this guy wasn't there through a dictionary and like help please fake passport please help so they put the story together and the management and the security guards and they they planned a, um, an escape plan and by this time I was at the place I was like I can't I can't do this for the rest of my life. I either try mm -hmm. escaping mm -hmm. and they kill me mm -hmm. or I die here, mm -hmm. which one is worse? And I really truly felt like, so my plan was to escape, go home back to Hungary as fast as possible, go to the police, keep my family safe and see what happens. Right, right, okay. Yeah. So how did it all go down? Exactly how we planned <laughs> until it wasn't like that. So I escaped with their help. I was hiding in Toronto for a couple of days until my flight was leaving. Uh, they put me in different places and the traffickers wow. found me. Really? Yeah, once I was on the eighth floor of a building, I was hiding there at the friend's house. Um, I think I had two more days before my flight was leaving back to Hungary. And I was hiding in the apartment and somehow they found out that I was at her place. And the uh, phone was ringing and I answered it because I didn't think, right? Right, yeah. And they're like, it's you. And they called me all kinds of names. I'm not going to repeat, but please use your wild imagination. Uh -huh. And we're going to come and get you. We're going to kill you. We're going to cut your throat. We're going to kill your mother. We're going to kill your brother, your cat. You're going to watch your cat die. We're going to save that last. And we're coming upstairs. I'm like, okay, so where am I going to go? It's the eighth floor of an apartment building. And I looked out the balcony, I looked over to the other balcony and there was camp gears. Like, okay. All right, well, I was on adrenaline, so kids don't try this at home, but I climbed through the balcony to the next balcony on adrenaline, oh my mind gosh. you. Go under the blanket. On the eighth like, floor. So you yeah, were literally on the eighth, on the eighth floor. floor and you went, oh, you went underneath the camping gear. Yeah, and I was like hiding. And I do remember like laying on a concrete and kind of just shaking like a leaf. And there was a little crack in the balcony where I could hear them yelling and banging the door. And I'm going to kill. Okay, okay, okay. So eventually they left and they were at the car and I can see it from the balcony, the little oh, cracks. Oh, that's good. They were yelling up and like, this is not over this is not over, you are done, we're going to kill you, we're going after your family. I'm like, okay, just wait till I get back. So I went back to Hungary. Um, so you were able to get on that flight? I was able to get on that and flight they did, so they nothing. didn't. So they didn't know that you were on that flight? They didn't know. Okay. Well, no, they didn't know. And what they did is they, try, they changed their flight and they tried to come back earlier because they were supposed to go two weeks after my flight, but they changed it that they, I found out that they were only a two days after me. Oh, wow. So my goal was to get in as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So I got in on a Tuesday. They got in on a Thursday. Uh, but I landed in Hungary, and the Hungarian police did not believe me. Really? And when I told them the part that I was a stripper, they got very happy about <gasps> that, and they pulled me aside. And Oh, no. Yeah. Well, did you go into the police station alone when you went in? Yeah. Yeah. And I was really sick too, so oh. I was just really sick and um, wow. yeah. And after that, they drove me home. Wow. Such a gentleman. And, uh, and they said they will call me, but they told me not to leave the country because right now I'm under investigation because I have a fake passport. So they said I'm probably going to go to jail. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Now, Turning the victim into a villain. That's horrible. Yeah. Okay. But that was the time. It wasn't the Hungarian yes. police. As a matter of fact, my mom was a cop. Oh my gosh, really? I grew up with police. This was my family, okay. which is why I trusted them. Yeah, of course. But I've never been on this side of the fence right. before. Right. And so I was definitely treated like a criminal. Mm. So at this point, things got interesting because the, um, so the police came to my door two days later, not these guys, the federal police, mm -hmm. and said, oh, we got your report. Turns out there is a real Sasha. Turns out this is a big group we've been looking for. Interpol is looking for them. So you can be a key witness mm -hmm. and uh, you can go to trial and go up against them. Or if you don't, you're going to go to jail. Oh, my gosh. So I grew up in a communism with a cop mother in a military setting. Right. Going to jail is not an option. Right. Going to court is not an option because then I'm going to have to talk about what happened. And that's right. a that huge was, amount exactly. of shame. 
So there was two in between and only because I was really traumatized, I felt like my only option is if I kill myself, but I didn't want to kill myself. But I was thinking about it. And as I, as I was thinking about it, a friend of mine called me from Canada. I only had one friend at the time. And she asked me, how am I doing? And I said, not so good. I really need to get out of here. And I had 14 days. Before, 14 before days you had to go on to before the Before anything yeah, started, yeah. right? And so she goes, well, come to Canada. I'm like, I can't. I can't come to Canada. I'm in the system. There's a bunch of stuff I didn't have time to explain, but I can't. I'm going to get deported. And then like, I just can't. I did save $1,000 before I, like, I, yeah, I had. So you I, squirreled it away. Yeah. You didn't give it to, the, okay, got No, it. but my brother was yelling at me, where's the money? We're going to lose our apartment. My mom started getting calls and like, what did you get involved in? And the TV station that mm -hmm. I worked at at the time basically fired me because questionable figures showed up at the station mm. and almost beat up a couple of people to find out where I am. That's incredible. So they destroyed my life yeah. completely. So I had nothing to come home to except right. my cat. So I, I had to make a decision. So I had money, but I, I didn't have I didn't know if I can fly back because of because um, I needed a new passport, basically. Right. Legally. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I had to apply, and they told me it's going to take seven days to get it. I got my ticket, and I got my ticket for a Friday, and I le left 10 days to get my passport. Right. right. By this time, the mafia was at my door <laughs> almost every day. The police was coming constantly. Mafia was calling me. My mom is calling me. It was the worst Worst week of my life. I Honestly, I lost so much. Don't worry, I gained it all back. But <laughs> um, it was horrible. Just being in fear, like Absolutely. you don't know Constant what's going to happen, right? And I just and needed panic. to get out. Yeah. So I would go to the passport office and uh, ask if, or the post office, and ask if I got my. It was a Wednesday. No, there's no package for you. Actually, it was a Tuesday. Then I would go on Wednesday. No, there's and every time I leave my mm -hmm. building, there's the mafia or the cops. There's the mafia and they're following me. They didn't know my plan. I it right. was before right. the computer times right. and AI and all that fun stuff. So I make it to the post office on Wednesday again, and they're like, "There's no passport." I'm like, "I need my passport." So on the way home, I remember going to a church, which I'm not religious because we grew up in a communism, not supposed to believe in God. But I had a complete meltdown in a church, and I was crying really loud. And the priest came oh, and wow. put his hand on me and said, "What's wrong, child? Like, what can be so?" I'm like, Wait. "I'm sure you have no idea." Don't get me started. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, we go on, and he's like, "Well, what do you need? Just ask God what you need." I'm like, "Okay, I need my passport." He's like, "Well, what do you mean?" I said, I told him the story. Right. He's like, "Well, have you checked your mailbox in the building?" I said, "No, I actually haven't." Well, maybe you should check there because sometimes they delivered it. I'm like, okay, this is funny. So I go home. Now it's Thursday, and I'm supposed to fly. At leave on Friday, day. yeah. And I open my mailbox, and my passport <gasps> is there. Wow. I get to the airport next morning, 6 a.m., and I had to kind of under the radar. Nobody knew. Mm -hmm. I get to the airport. I get on the escalator. There's the Air Canada lady. I'm like, yes. Okay, we're getting on a flight. We're going to get out of here. It's like I'm almost out of here. Cops didn't catch up on. The mafia didn't figure it out. I haven't said anything to my mom. Get on the top of the... Oh, and I had five bucks left, by the way, for wow. the trip to uh, go to Canada. $1,000. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So you were going to land in Canada with $5? $5. Well, probably less because I probably had to buy a sandwich yeah. at some point, yeah. but whatever. Anyway, so I flew to Canada, and I landed, and they let me in as a visitor. And, um, and you've lived here ever since? I lived here ever since. I didn't speak English, but now wow. I do. Okay, so you had that incredible experience. Now you are here advocating and helping Verifin fight these criminals. So how did you go from being a victim of just horrific, horrific crimes to becoming an advocate and you know, kind of creating what, you, what you've done? And talk to us about your journey from that point. Thank you. I incredibly, for many years, there was no such a thing as human trafficking. So there was no laws. They didn't right. call it human trafficking. So for many years, I thought this was just a very bad story, and I better not tell anybody because it was all my fault. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah. And it's probably only me who it happened to. So one day, about 10 years later, I saw an article in a newspaper, and it was a big story on human trafficking. Like, oh, that sounds terrible. What is that? 
So I read it and it was Russian girls being trafficked in. I'm like, that right. is my story. Right. So um, I have had a short court case in Canada early on. We did take the Canadian guys to court, but it, they only called it a sex assault case. Mm -hmm. So I did have a police officer who became a surrogate father to me. So I called him and I'm like, Mike, there is this thing. It's called human. He's like, yes, Demea. I wish we had those laws when you were here. I'm like, you mean like, you mean, you mean I'm not crazy? He's like, you're not crazy. This, this. I'm like, mm, okay. Now at least I know I'm not nuts. And it wasn't right, my fault. Right. And I'm not alone. Right. There were stats and right. everything. I'm like, okay, now we know what to do with this past. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, became a volunteer and eventually I started an organization and I started working with victims. I had a safe house where we would oh, go wow. and pick up the victims from police stations or would assist the police in operations. Okay, so you had a relationship with the police and they would, okay. So yeah. they would kind of alert you when someone was coming in or yeah. when someone was there? Yeah, so wow. we we had a safe house right. and we did crisis calls for six, almost seven years. And we would pick the victims up, take them to the safe house, eventually go to court, and we would lose the court cases. <gasps> go to court, lose the court. Go to pick, court, lose. And six, seven years later, it started to become a little old and emotionally and physically. And it yeah, just, exactly. Anyways, it's so draining. Yeah. yeah, and so I would like you to visualize this. Here's the big society. And in the big society, we have this huge problem but nobody knows about it. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows we have a problem. So imagine this tiny little community in the middle of it, maybe 5,000 people, police, social service providers, church, be like mm -hmm. advocates. Mm -hmm. And we are working so hard, but it felt like that we were drowning. Yeah. Cause we can take all the victims out, but we have no sustainable support. So we just lost another court case and I was absolutely, I just had enough. Honestly, I was I didn't know what to do next. This is something we built so and we saw the we saw the outcome, the ripple effect when you take out the victim, what happens next? We've seen it over and over. But I needed I needed help. Yeah. So I quit advocacy for a bit because it mm -hmm. was very it was just difficult. So draining. Yeah. yeah. And I said to the God that I didn't believe before, I said, like, can you just send me some sign, please? Like, we need help. And I took a break, and during that time, I got an email from a woman named Tanya from a company called Verifin from Newfoundland. And it's like, oh, we are a financial company. We are looking for um, help. Uh, we're working on human trafficking. And I said, financial company, Newfoundland, what are you going to do about delete? <laughs> My God, I really need to talk to you. I need some help here. Two days later, I got another email from Tanya well, I haven't heard from you, and I was just a delete. God, we were, <laughs> I really need help. I got uh, one more email from Tanya, you know, it's the three right, girls. Right. I got an email again. Okay, I really need some answers. And then I was like, okay, what is this about? How can I find? So long story short, I'm like, yeah, it's Newfoundland. I've never been to Newfoundland. So I came to Newfoundland to see Newfoundland and do this presentation to this company. That you'd never heard of. That I never heard of. And how are they going to help victims of human right. trafficking, really? But, okay, let's hear this out. And I was really tired, to be honest. I was just, I worked in a world that was dark. Yeah, and every we, day. Yeah, and we had $2 to feed ourselves every day. Mm -hmm. It's a nonprofit, mm -hmm. you, you know, right. it's a whole different world. And cops, everybody's exhausted and grumpy. Mm -hmm. So I come to their office, and they are financial crime fighters. So I expected, like you know, really serious people and like not sleeping on, because that's how you change the world. You don't eat, you're broke, and you're sick all the time. So I thought, <laughs> I walked into the office, the first office, and everyone looked happy. And like, they look like they slept, they have coffee machines, and they bring in lunch. I'm like, <laughs> what is this place? What do you mean you do good and you look happy? How is that even possible? So I did my presentation and uh, I was like, okay, this, this was fun. This is great. Uh, I'm going to go home now because mm -hmm. I still have a problem to solve. And Tanya came and said, um, your flight is not leaving because of the fog. Of course. And uh, that afternoon, uh, the engineer um, called me over and said, would you like to see what we do? I said, well, mine as well. I'm already here. You guys are awesome. I'm having a great time. Let's do it. So I stood in the room 
and it's a real life, real time transactions about a possible trafficking case. So he explains to me what it is, and I and he's like, "Can you tell me why this is human trafficking?" Oh, interesting. He's like it says it is, but can you explain to us why? I said, "Hotels, motel, rental, car." Let me see the timeline, and we became this team in oh, five minutes. Oh, that must have been that must have been amazing. It was so much fun. Well, fun, but it was right. it was really exciting. And then I said, "Okay, let's pull up our Facebook account. Can we find? Yeah." Facebook right there, there's pictures. Let's pull up other information. Within five minutes, with, with tools that I usually use to investigate this without the financial stuff, we put the picture together. And I looked at him and I said, this is what you guys do? <laughs> he goes, well, yeah. He's so humble. I'm like, no, you don't understand. This is what you guys can do? He's like, well, yeah. All of the sudden, I'm not kidding, Adina. I looked at him and I saw a gold halo <laughs> coming out of his head. I'm like, oh my gosh. If this was available two weeks ago at one of the court <gasps> case, oh, right. it would have been no longer a he said, she said. It wouldn't have to be based on her and her story to sell why she's a victim. It's right. not up to her. There's evidence, 80 page of evidence of a financial exploitation, mm -hmm. black and white, right there. So I looked at Charles and I said, how can I help? What can we do? So that's our story that's, and I'm sticking to I it. I know, that's the beginning of an amazing relationship. Yeah. So you've been working with us and partnering with us now for several years. And, mm -hmm. and it's been an amazing partnership between our team, the Verifin team, um, and you, as you've been helping us really understand what are the patterns of behavior? What is specific to human trafficking that shows up in banking transactions? So of course, you know, things change and you know, it evolves. They, criminals always, they change their behaviors over time, but your ability to help us understand and look at all of the evidence, as you called it, you know, it's true evidence. It makes such a difference to us because we can train our engines to get smarter and smarter and smarter in finding these criminals. So, so maybe you talk about what relationship then have you had with Verifin since that moment? Yeah, it was incredible. I think it was a great uh, realization for both of us. And what we realized then is, okay, now that, now that Verifin has a solution, we should really let the banks know that they have a problem. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that was step number one. And Verifin did a phenomenal job. We went on a tour for up to three years. I think we saw over 200 cities and spoke to over 6,000 bankers at the time that they were uh, prospects and clients mm -hmm. already. And we started educating bankers on human trafficking. And it became a ripple, ripple effect movement because bankers who were at the time just started out, became management leader right. and were in decision making seats and started to say, we have a problem, we have a solution and we can do something about it, why not? Right, and the banks are on the front lines of fighting these, cr these crimes. So for them to have the tools and the context, because it's one thing to have all the transaction data, it's another thing to have the context for them to actually feel like they're making a true difference in helping a person, right? It, it turns it from information on a screen to a human story. And that, that really makes it so that they know what they're doing is just, it's really important, right? And I it, love that you say that because I actually don't think it's enough to put in the red flags from FinCEN or FinTrack or whatever. Just put it in every year and update it mm -hmm. because it's not enough. There are flags that comes from lived experience right. and perspectives from people who lived it or even law enforcement who's investigating this, right? It's, it's not enough to know the flags. You have to understand the whole big picture, the behavior exactly. of the crime, as you said. Exactly. So I think Verifin did a really good job inviting somebody with the lived experience in from day one, which is when we tweaked their product, yep. which is why their false positives were way less than any other uh, company out there. Right. And that's the thing is that, that that partnership, you were helping us figure out how to make the models smarter. Right, which then makes, of course, us more effective. But then going out and talking to the banks and the people at the banks who are on the front line trying to figure this out, 
they actually feel like they're having a true impact. So it's not just, I have to go through another alert. I've got to figure out another alert. I've got to figure, it's no, I'm actually, I'm helping this person. I'm helping this person. I'm helping this person, right? It just changes the way that they think about their own role, um, which I think is really, that's what makes it so effective. So our tool is more effective. And then the actual people who are having to deal with our tool and manage, manage all the alerts, they become more effective because they understand they're having impact. I love that you said that because what we got so passionate about on these tours is when we would tell the bankers, would you have believed when I told you that when you go to work with two clicks, you can save somebody's life? And they're like, but how do we do that? I said, by reporting. That report goes immediately to law enforcement. And then at some point, hopefully soon, the law enforcement acts on it. And why is that important? When we get take out of that situation sooner rather than later, every single day where you save me from trauma, you extend my life much longer and my healing journey much shorter. So you actually giving me a real chance to have a, a real happy life from right. a bank. Right. From your computer. Yeah, exactly. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> and that's what makes everyone here at Verifin and at NASDAQ work as hard as we do, because we know that we are actually having that impact on, on real people and making it so that we have a chance to make lives better and to make sure that the, the system is safer, right? It's just, it's amazing how much of a mission is really driven out of this organization. Um, and, and I can tell you, as we've acquired a fair fin into NASDAQ, everyone at NASDAQ feels now that we are crime fighters. Everyone at NASDAQ feels that we're part of this important mission. So I just wanna thank you so much for the partnership we have with you. I know that we are gonna be taking this to an yet another leg of the journey together. So we're really, really excited to continue to work with you. And thank you so much for telling your story to me. Thank you. Thank you for listening.